Thank you. Enjoy the talk. Thank you. And while we're giving applause, please give a big round of applause to the organizers. Uh, they are doing an amazing job. J Prime is a it's it's great so far. So thank you for making it happen. Um, okay. So in the next 50 minutes or so, we're going to talk about machine learning, Java. Is it possible at all? Um, it's been oh, machine learning has is very known that it's been uh, a Python first language. Uh, but in the next minutes, we will try to see how we, what we can do with with Java and if it's possible at all at all to have or build, train, deploy uh, machine learnings and uh, and Java. And before that, the boring part. Uh, I am Mohammed. I work for an audio streaming company called Spotify. I'm also a developer expert, uh, Google developer expert for Google Cloud. And thank you for joining me today. Uh, I'm originally Moroccan. Uh, I've been born and raised and spent uh, 20 more years in Morocco. And then at some point in time, I had to move to S Sweden, uh, especially Stockholm. Now, if you want to talk about the weather contrast and the weather change, I'm happy to complain for the, the rest of the day, but that's not the main topic of the presentation. So moving to a new country, it's challenging. It's both exciting and challenging. Uh, we'll focus on the challenging part, uh, mainly because it's a new culture. When you move there, you lost your references. You need to understand the culture and most importantly, understand the language, or at least learn the language and understand uh, what happens around you, uh, especially now that if you move there, you're an immigrant, so you want to understand what's happening behind you. Not only politics, but everything that is happening. Learning a language is not easy. Um, so Swedish is relatively a uh, hard language. And then while trying to find techniques and learn things about how I can learn a language fast, I stumbled upon this book from Binny Lewis. So Binny Lewis is a guy who basically managed to break how to learn a language fast. Uh, so he did, he speaks a dozen of languages, maybe more. Uh, and what he did basically is he built a little knowledge about the language, basic one, and then he traveled to a country or a city that speaks that knowledge, uh, language, and then he only speaks that language with the locals. And what happened is he will use whatever little vocabulary he has and then try to improve it. And what happened is he start to speak in the local language and they will learn new voca vocabulary for sure, but then he will make errors and then the locals will try to correct him. So he basically follows the trial, trial and error uh, analogy. And when, it, when we learn a new language, or we want to learn a language, there are basically two paths that we want to follow. The first one is, or the second one, the one on, my, on your left, uh, it's basically the Bini, Bini uh, trick. It's basically trying to speak the language and do make errors and do learn from those mistakes and you basically you will learn patterns. And that's what Bini did. He was basically learn learning patterns that will enable him to speak the language. Uh, it's not going to be the most uh, correct language so far, but he will learn enough and the structure from the patterns in order to basically have a discussion, learn what's happening uh, around him and understand actually what's happening. Traditional language learning, uh, it's basically we're, we're le re learned rules. So when a language, when we want to learn a language, we go to schools and then we learn that the subject should be, should be first and then the verb and that de depends on whatever language you want to learn, right? Uh, so we learn the structure of the language and how to build a sentence. And then we learn grammar and then learn the vocabulary and then build, learn the structure of the language. So there is a structured way of learning and there is the unstructured way, if you may. And it's basically learning the patterns. Now, if we go back to programming and development and software engineering, because I expect we're all programmers here, right? So when we have a new issue, like a new project that we want to start, as simple as modeling 
someone that is walking. And that's a product requirement or a business requirement that we have, right? So the product manager came in and he said, look, I want you to model a person that is walking. So that's a requirement. And then we try to figure out how we can model that requirement in a machine language. So we use our programming languages, be it Java, Go, Rust, whatever you, wanna, whatever you like. And then you try to find the unit of measure, a rule that you can uh, measure or implement a person that is walking. And then you find speed to be good enough. So we say that if speed is less than four, then you consider that person as walking. You deliver the project, everyone is happy, you go to a race, and then you move on with your life. Then, you know, it happens every time. The product manager came in with a new requirement, the, pro the project was a huge success, and we need to manage, and we need to model a new requirement. And that is, we need now to implement a person that is running. Well, you spend a lot of time, and then you figure out that you can use the same unit of measure, which is speed, right? So you add a new, you add a new rule there saying that if the, if the speed is less than four, you consider the, the person as running. Otherwise, you consider the person as, okay. If less than four is walking, otherwise it's running. You deploy that, it's fine. And then the product manager came in with a new request, which is, let's try to uh, model a person that is cycling. You use the same unit of, 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 of measure, which is speed. And then you model, you add a new rule saying that if it's less than 12 units of measure, then it's running. Otherwise, you consider the person as cycling. And up until this point, you were adding rules and trying to model the world based on this unit of measure, right? And you did find this unit of measure, or we did find and then we try to map the word and model the word based on that. Now, what happened if the program manager came in or product manager came in and asked you to model a person that is doing golf? And that's tricky, right? Because golf, you do it basically standing. So there is no speed in there. So what happened is you would need to come up with a new unit of measure, a new unit of modeling to map the person that is playing golf. Because like he's standing, but also he's, he's playing. So speed is no longer valid, and you need to come up with a new thing. And that's what we call, that. what happens in, in real life. You start to complain and saying that the product is basically legacy, and we need to rewrite the whole thing. Uh, and that's to say, that's the way we deal with programs in software engineering up until recently, was basically a traditional way of making the machine smart. And what, what we do basically is we have data, we write the rules, and our job as programmers, software engineers, developers, is basically writing the rules to make the machine smart, to make the machine perform what, the, what we want them to perform. As simple as that. So we write whatever language, as, as complex as your program is, as fantastic your architecture is, it's basically adding rules to make the machine behave the way you wanted it to be. So you write the rules, you pass the data, and you expect some answers. And then when the answer is wrong, that's what we call a bug. And then we try to tweak the rules, modify the rules in order to make the program runs correctly. Now that traditional, that's not traditional, but that's our job basically as programmers. Machine learning, on the other hand, try to challenge that or reverse it. So what we do is instead of writing the rules, we let the machine figure out the rules. So we feed the algorithm the data and the answers. And we need a large amount of data. Let's get done with that. So we feed it with the answers, we feed it with the data, and we let the machine basically try to figure it itself and then come up with the set of rules that, en that enables it to um, basically come up with the best answer. The answer is not going to be 100% correct, but it's going to be as close as we want it to be. And that's what we call precision of the prediction. So machine learning is basically is a way to let the machine learn by itself by providing it with a large amount of data. Data here is really important. Um, so machine learning deals with a large amount of data. The larger the data you have, the better the, the, your model is going to be, basically. And it, you, lear, you let it learn over time. And then when you notice that your precision is starting to go down, you feed it with another data in order to improve, to improve itself or have a manual correction there that's try to 
uh, basically corrected. But that's as simple as the fancy word machine learning, artificial intelligence, whatever that word basically means. Uh, now, in pop magazines, in articles, especially nowadays, everyone is talking about LLMs, machine learning, AIs. It's a bit overwhelming. Uh, so, trying to do a little bit of categorization here, uh, artificial intelligence simply means it's the field that everything goes through or give everything goes under. Artificial intelligence started way in the 50s. In the 1950s, a lot of scientists, a lot of engineers sit together in order to make the machine or an attempt to make the machine smarter. Uh, they put a lot of papers, a lot of efforts, uh, and they had a little success, which set the path, set the ground for what we have seen today. But then we figured out that machine learning, as much as it excelled in understanding and writing models that uh, deals with specific problems, such as like playing chess. We have models that play chess and can beat the best chess player in the world. However, it requires a lot of time and it doesn't deal with fuzzy uh, problems. So as, as, as the moment we try to do picture categorization or tagging, traditional artificial intelligence fails. And then we come up with a subfield of artificial intelligence, which is machine learning. And it tried and, and started around the 90s or the 80s. And the idea here, basically, is provide the, provide the machine with a lot of data using statistical, mathematical statistics, and trying to, it's basically statistics, provided with a lot of data, and let it figure out the rule. It's basically equations that uh, change the weight and the variables, and then come up with the best equation possible to match the real world. Um, so when we talk about machine learning, we, the first thing that comes to mind is a lot of mathematics, which is relatively true. But it's not as true as the machine learning engineers want us to do, with all respect to machine learning engineers. So mathematical statistics differs to, or machine learning differs to uh, mathematical statistics the same way that chemistry and medicine differs. Uh, medicine is a, is a subfield of chemistry, but it differs in so many ways. Uh, mathematical statistics differs with machine learning. Machine learning is a subfield of uh, mathematical statistics, but it deals with a large amount of data, and it's, it is more hands-on compared to mathematical statistics. Now, don't get me wrong, there is some math involved in there, but not as much as you would expect. And then we would have deep learning. And deep learning is a subfield of machine learning that basically deals with learning from multiple representation of the model. So with machine learning, we have, we learn from, we call it shallow, le shallow learning. It's basically we feed the data and we try to map with the best model possible. Deep learning is basically having the layer successfully learning from, from each other. So we, the probably this slide will make it this one. This slide will make it a lot more easier. So basically, we are having multiple layers in there. Uh, and the deep in deep learning, does it have anything to do with the deep knowledge? It just has to do with how deep and how many layers you have in order to build your model. So you have probably read that it's trying to map our neurons and the human brain it has nothing to do with that. There is no scientific proof around that. It's basically trying to learn from successive layers, basically. So we are having multiple layers that learn from each, from each other, each one learning, preparing a model and passing the data around. And in a production model, we will basically have dozens or even hundreds of layers in order to build a production model in there. Uh, and then the subfield of deep learning is what we, everyone is talking about recently is generative AI and LLMs. Uh, LLMs deals with a very large amount of data. We talk about internet, the internet size of data. So that's a lot of data to deal with. And it has a lot of equations and the model is big. And that's why the, to build your LLM, it would, I mean, to build a ChatGPT standard LLM, it would need a huge servers. They're basically because it's a lot of computation happening behind the scenes because of the large data and the way it tries to model it. Up until deep learning, 
we were trying to basically predict the world. We were trying to learn from the data and try to map it as much as you can. Generative AI tries to come up with new things. And you have heard about uh, hallucination in LLMs and generative AI, and that's not a bug, that's actually a feature. We want those LLMs to be as innovative as they can. So we want them to produce new content, learn new things from the data that is provided. So hallucination is a big topic, but it's, it's a bug, not a feature. So it's, to, it's basically trying to be creative, and creativity can come with a cost. OK, moving on. Um, so what has deep learning achieved so far? A lot of things. We have it in our phone. We have it in our machines. Uh, we, are, we are now having deep models and machine learning deployed on our phones. We use it every day to tag your pictures. Uh, we can't imagine our life without uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning now, right? A lot of things uh, has happened. However, my frustration was, because I'm a back-end engineer, uh, I'm not a machine learning engineer, so um, everything I said is basically my understanding as a back-end engineer. Uh, I do a lot of Java. And whenever I wanted to learn machine learning, I stumbled upon this list. It's basically a lot of math. I suck in math. I mean, I did well enough to pass my exams, but nothing more. Um, and then we had gradient descent, vectors, matrices. Is there any machine learning engineers here? OK, so I can have fun. Uh, linear algebra and all of that. So there was a lot of, a lot of knowledge involved that I don't, didn't, don't want to learn. And then there was Python on the other hand. Python is a great language, no offense, but I, I would love to, because I'm a Java engineer, I would love to learn Java and uh, st stick with the Java language. And then and I wasn't alone. The Java community has spoken a lot about it, written a lot of blogs, uh, and started to basically make voices uh, around how we can make Java play nicely with machine learning. And Humphrey uh, basically wrote a very good blog back in 2018 on how we can make Java a good citizen when it comes to machine learning. And probably for Java developer, you probably already saw this list. Uh, Java is great when it comes to, because of its performance, security built in, a WARA principle, a write once run anywhere. It's a mature, mature ecosystem. You basically have anything to do anything that you want to have. Uh, it's one of the languages that if you want to build something, you will have an option. Probably not the best language for the job, but it will, it will perform it. And then it has a great community support. And this conference is basically a great, uh, great example of such a big community. And then, so the rest 30 minutes, we're going to talk about frameworks, options that you can have in order to build machine learning, train machine learning, deploy machine learning using Java. Uh, the first one we're going to see is JSR381 or VSREC. So it's standardization within the Java community, basically d deals with image recognition in order to uh, help build machine learning that deals with image recognition. And then we will dive into Deep Learning 4G, DGL, Deep Learning 4G from Eclipse Foundation, Deep Java Library, DGL in short, for, uh, from EWS, and then finally, Tribio from uh, Oracle. Starting with GSR381, uh, the VSREC API in short. Uh, so it's basically, it was uh, GSR, a uh, standard uh, proposal to Java community, to the GCP, in order to have a standardization for, uh, for machine learning. And it specializes in visual recognition. That's why the name VSREC. And it deals only with image recognition and uh, image uh, handling. So it does image classification, object detection, and also trans transfer learning. Uh, and it also supports exporting the models in uh, other mod like other frameworks, such as ONX, or like some implementations. Uh, I did a lot of talking. A uh, little bit of the code would be helpful. So how many of you watched the Silicon Valley? Which is, OK, a few hands. Um, so you will get the reference. But for the rest, uh, so Silicon Valley was an American TV show. And then in one of the, can I increase it? No, I can't. Uh, in one of the 
episodes, uh, was an engineer was tasked to basically build an app. Uh, or he built an app, basically, that this took a picture and decided if the image is actually a, a picture of a hot dog or not a hot dog. The expectation was so high for the demo, but then the app is literally that. You take a picture, and it tells you if it's a picture, it's a hot dog and not a hot dog. And that's what, what we are trying to do as well. And everything that I'm going to show is basically running on my computer. Uh, so it's, that's how simple it's becoming to basically build a machine learning uh, model. And even the trading was happening uh, in my machine. Uh, so I want to start with the Vistrec API, uh, which is here. So look how compact it is. Now, when I first started with it, I didn't believe that it was that much compact. Uh, it's 2024 Java. It's very small, very concise. Uh, it follows um, convention over configuration. It's really cool. Um, and then, so what we do basically here is build, uh, we're dealing with images. So we're building an image classifier, and we're dealing with buffered image. Uh, so our input class is also an image. So uh, we provide an, uh, an image. We specify the, the length and the height of my data set, and my data set is here. We have tests with two directories, hot dog or not hot dog, and then the train data set, also two directories, hot dog or not hot dog. And then in the hot dog, you will find some nice and ugly hot dogs. And then in not hot dog, you find, will find everything. OK, yeah, whatever. Uh, so you get the idea. So those are the images. And then I'm telling it to basically fetch the labels path. Uh, basically, the labels are, because I'm my model, I want to decide if it's a hot dog or not a hot dog. That's basically my model. Uh, and the labels is in the labels file. It's here. So basically, I have two labels. Either it's a hot dog or not a hot dog, as simple as that. Uh, the training path is where my data is. And it should be indexed somewhere. It's here. So what I have here is the path of all my images that I use so in training. Uh, with yeah, the path of all the images and then their labels, if it's a hot dog or basically a not hot dog. So the, the model or oh, the training program will go over them and then uh, try to read the image and then the label of each image. And then the network arch architecture is defined in a JSON file. Now, I like that so much. Um, a lot of people don't like JSON, but I like because it's basically I have my configuration separate, and then my program is looking much more con uh, compact. And then this is actually my model, or my uh, algorithm to build the model, or my neural network, basically. Uh, it's convolutional neural network. And then convolutional is a type of neural networks. It's basically deal with uh, images. Uh, so what we're trying to do here is we're defining our input layer uh, we're defining the convolutional layer. So basically, convolution, why? Because an image is hundreds or even thousands of pixels. Uh, so if we want to train for each picture, it's going to be too much. Uh, so what we're trying to do is to split the image into tiles uh, and then take, try to find interesting pieces in each tile. And then those interesting pieces are going to be mapped to a matrix, and then we're going to train on, on the matrix. Uh, and then... Convolution is one layer, and then when we do the try to find the interesting pieces, we basically uh, try to convert them into uh, a matrix. And then we, it's, I said in the beginning to build a uh, true machine learning model, you would, you would need hundreds of layers, but I'm running on my machine, so I have only one layer in there. And then each machine learning model, which will have the input layer, which is this one, and then it will have the fully connected layer, or the end layer, which is basically converging everything. So basically, you have your model, in this case, images. We took the tiles. We uh, d find the interesting part, convert it into a matrix, and then take this matrix and uh, convert it into an input for the next layer, and so on and so forth. And then we build a fully connected, or a, a whole connected neural network. And then the, uh, the output is my, the, basically the model and how I want it to be. So this is basically the definition of my uh, 
neural network. Very shallow, very condensed, but just serve for the demo purposes. And I'm running it again on my machine. So that was the definition of my neur uh, neural network. Uh, max error, the amount of error that I want, that if, if it exceeds, basically repeat. Uh, how many iterations I want the program to, uh, or the model to run for the training, the learning, the learning rate, uh, and then when, f when you finish, basically export the model in what we call hotdog.net. And I already run it, as I mentioned, and then I have my model exported here. So that was the training part. So we basically start the training, run it, and then go for a walk, come back, uh, and then find your, hopefully, your model exported. Um, let's assume that your model is fine, you deployed it, uh, and then you want to integrate it with it in your app, and that's when the inference actually happens. So inference is very simple here. Uh, so I'm uh, oh, uploaded my, or getting my, oh, not again. Hello? IntelliJ? Is Merit here? Okay. Oh, my machine frozen. Hello? Oh, gosh. Interesting. Okay, it's going to be fun. Okay, where are the NTDJ folks? Okay, I, I'm, I'm going to the force restart. I'm sorry. Oh, interesting. Demo effect. No worry. Thank you. OK, while it's, while it's rebooting. So what would happen is basically, I'm, I'm going to load the model. So basically, as you are up uploading or getting any, any file from your system. And then we will run into, we'll have two images basically to run to check uh, if it's a hot dog or not hot dog. Should be. Very easy and hopefully super intuitive to understand. But it's going to take a while. Yeah. OK, but what I like about Visric is actually it's, uh, it's, it's compact and it's standard. Uh, and it follows convention over configuration, as I mentioned. So it's very intuitive. Uh, didn't, don't require a lot of knowledge. It provides the APIs. Java APIs to uh, work with. And uh, compared to other frameworks that we're going to see afterwards, uh, you're going to see a lot of things that I probably shouldn't be sharing. So bear with me here. Um, and compared to other frameworks that we're going to see in a minute, it's, it follows, as I mentioned, convention over configuration. It feels, it feels very modern compared to others. And then you, s you have seen that it's actually quite compact. It's still lines for the whole thing. And then everything else is exported to other files. Your labels is a file. Definition of your architecture is another file. Uh, and then everything else is in configuration files, which is really good. Uh, it follows the standard that we have with uh, other frameworks. And then you can basically uh, um, use it with any modern Java framework, be it uh, Quarkus, be it uh, Spring Boot, or, or any other, which is really good. Uh, OK, back. Hello? Do I have internet? Yes, I do. OK, sorry for the small hustle. OK, back. I was here, right? Cool. Uh, and then I was, I wanted to sh demo this one. So don't. Get in your file, uh, create, uh, basically get in the classifier again, and then uh, download, uh, upload, get in an image. So we have two images here. Uh, one is, no, that's the data set. One is a very ugly hot dog, and the other one is a, a even uglier pizza. Uh, and then what I should be able to do is basically pass it to the hot dog. I'm uploading my image, and I'm saying, um, because as I mentioned again, it's a question of numbers. So I'm getting, calling my classifier or my model and then trying to predict if it's a hot dog or not hot dog. It's a very simple model with one, uh, one layer again. So it said if it's more than 50% confidence, consider it as a hot dog. Otherwise, consider it as a not hot dog. I did not run 
run this before joining here, but I run it before. It should be basically. Hello? Hello, please? Hello? Where is it? Run? What? What's happening with IntelliJ today? To do? Servers? Run? Nothing? Interesting, IntelliJ. I, have, I will have a lot of complete memory today. Gosh, please, kill me. Close all tabs. No, I want to run this one. Hello, okay. Inference, run. Oof, okay, where? Nothing. What the hell? Say it again. Files. Remove what? Invalidate caches. Oh, okay. Let's follow. Okay. So happy now? Okay. Interesting. Okay, I'll move on. Uh, NTDJ is an amazing product. <laughs> okay. It should work now, right? Uh, hello? Oh, it's, uh, oh, and Dixon, anyway. Super fun. Okay, I gave up. Uh, moving on, A deep learning for Java. That's uh, another framework. It's one of the oldest and uh, intense Java machine learning library. Um, so it's basically owned by uh, Eclipse Foundation. And what it does, uh, so it's provide a layer on API, Java API, that's the deep learning 4G basically. And then they have, they build their own uh, machine or the, their own statistical mathematical library. It basically does the heavy lifting and does all the computation, computation and that's what's called ND4G. Uh, so it's basically a linear algebra li library that does all the computation. And then in the back end, they use or they benefit from uh, Java CCP and libND4G. And that's a C++ implementation. So basically, their ND4G library uses C++ libraries in order to run your model or train your model either in CPU or GPU. Uh, so, and that's to be super fast as well. So your API, your API that we're going to use is basically uh, Java API, but behind the scenes it runs within uh, C++ and C. And it's really powerful. Uh, it gives you a lot of tools. It basically gives you a tool set, uh, and then it asks you to deal with it. Uh, the, the API is very verbose. It's very different than the one with the Vistrick that we saw earlier. But it gives you more power. It gives you more tools, and it lets you do your job. It was designed basically initially for machine learning engineers, uh, and they made the decision to be more verbose uh, and expose basically everything. Uh, OK. Interesting. Do I have internet? Yes, I do. The libraries. Why are, why is Marvin complaining? OK. OK. Last run. Oh, gosh. Um, OK. Anything? OK. There is a high progress is a hot dog. Uh, finally. This presentation is weird. This. Uh, Fun, fun fact, I downloaded IntelliJ yesterday. So that's a mistake that I should never do again. And then if I switch it to pizza, it should say it's not a hot dog. Yeah, that's basically it. So it's a demo. You know it's work. Uh, not a big deal. Um, OK, killing that. I'm not going to run any demo anymore. So remember how compact uh, Vistric was? Check that. So that's the same thing, but using deep learning for uh, deep learning for G. Yes. Uh, so it's basically more verbose API, but it's even more powerful. Uh, so here are all the configurations that I have given my uh, channels. It's basically dealing with images, RGB. So we're three channels, the batch size, the, num the number of labels. Again, you see you see recall it's two. 
uh, the training data set, the, the testing data set, and the seed number and number of box is the number of iterations. And then we download all the data, uh, split it into two, test and train, and then get the labels. And that's something uh, that they have. So they each can figure out by itself the number of labels uh, if you don't want to provide it explicitly. And then they provide transformers. So imagine you have a subset of the data. You have a minimal amount of data, uh, like the images. I have like hundreds of images. If you want to extend it and make your program even more powerful to train it on other data sets, you can basically transform the image. You can rotate it, make it black and white, and that will increase the number of training images. And that's something that Deep Learning 4G also offers as well. Uh, so processing the image, and then that's basically our uh, neural network. Everything that we saw in that JSON file is basically here, but it's, again, uh, with more configuration. All of that is basically trying how we can set the initial uh, weights, uh, because when you run your program, the initial weights should be random. What algorithm you want to have to, should, to set the initial uh, weights, what optimization, how you update the learning, uh, the learning rate, and so on and so forth. Uh, so those are basically each one have different number of algorithms implemented for you behind the scenes. You just need to use it. But again, it's, it, it provides you with a set of tools that you need to uh, pick one that suits you for yourself. And then it's a similar thing. We have our input layer and then our convo convolutional layer. And then again, splitting the image into tiles, getting the interesting parts, and then converting to a matrix, uh, converting everything. And here we have actually two layers. So taking the first one, uh, the output of the first layer will be the input of the second layer, as in here. And then getting that matrix, learning the entry representation, trying to condense the learning. Uh, and then we'll end up with the output layer, basically. Um, OK. And then one of the interesting, interesting things that DGL has is a UI server. So your server is basically a UI that you can follow your, while your model is training, you can follow how it's going, how the precision is going, is going up or is going down, are there any issues with, the, with uh, the, the training. So we can follow all of that basically from here. Um, so we are loading the data, setting up the model. You see that it's more verbose. And then we are basically trying to iterate. Basically, the model will uh, run itself. And then... Something that we were lacking in Visrec or was implemented behind the scene is basically evaluating the model. So you're training the model on your data. And the testing data set is basically trying to validate your hypothesis, validate the things that your model trained it on, and verifying that your uh, model is actually correct or ha has a high precision. So whenever, yeah, we split it into test and um, train, and then we save the model in hodl.pn as well. It's, it's, it's very similar. Another thing that Deep, Deep Learning 4G supports is what we call transfer learning. Transfer learning is, uh, in most of the cases, you will find well-defined, battle-tested models, superly optimized that, were, that are generally available, that you can use. But then you have a specific need in that large model. So what you can do is you can transfer the learning or specialize it in your subset model. So, for example, here I'm having uh, ResNet. ResNet is a very known, uh, we will have a demo of it afterwards, but a will, very known image tagging. So, we provide it to an image, it basically tells you if it's uh, an animal, if it's a person, if it's a cake, if it's whatever, with a precision. So, we're exp importing that uh, image or importing that model and basically trying to add another layer to fine tune it to our problem, which is basically detecting if it's a hot dog or not hot dog. So it's basically uh, this layer here. So uh, again, deep learning is about the layers, and all the deep is all the layers that you have. So we are taking all the knowledge that was trained on ResNet, which is the original uh, model, and then we add in another layer to serve our need. And then we do the same thing, uh, the UI server, and then we save the model. I'm not going to run it just for the case of not having any issues anymore. Um, so Deep Learning 4G, as I mentioned, uh, it's really powerful. It supports multiple uh, types of architecture, uh, neural network architectures, whether it's CNN, uh, FNN, and then, yeah, all of those fancy words. 
It supports exporting and importing the models from different other well-known frameworks, such as PyTorch and uh, TensorFlow and Keras. By the way, the Deep Unix 4G, the API is very uh, heavy inspired from Keras. If you ever worked with Keras, which is a Python framework built on top of TensorFlow, Deep Unix 4G is very similar in the way it deals with things. Uh, it has Indy 4G, the library that's mentioned. It's uh, the linear algebra li library that they built. It's very powerful. It supports uh, batch process. I mean, you can split your training into multiple nodes. It's, re it's, it's really powerful. And then it has distributed tr training capabilities that I mentioned, and it has Model Zoo. Uh, so if you go to Deep Learning 4G website, you will have some models. Model Zoo is basically uh, a data store artifactory of models that Deep Learning 4G already provided for you, so we can use out of the box. Uh, Deep Learning 4G, basically a machine learning, deep learning uh, framework. You can build models for uh, image recognition, natural language processing, uh, recurrent neural networks, and stuff like that. You can build chatbots, virtual assistants, but not chat GPT ones, the old ones. Like if you have Siri, Alexa, Google Assistant, those models are using basically NLP. Uh, and then, ah, previously, now they are all converging to LNMs. And then reinforcement learning, and that's what we saw. But again, I mentioned that the learning curve is very high uh, because it's, it provides you with a tool set, with a toolbox that have everything that you need, and then it, deal, it, it lets you deals with it, deal with it. So it can be frustration, uh, frustrating sometimes. Uh, lack of high abstractions. Uh, this rec was very tiny to write. Uh, you don't have to go deep into knowledge uh, in order to build something. Deep Unix 4G, you don't have that. You need to uh, be, you know what you do. And in a slow release cycle, especially lately, it's uh, starting to get slower to release stuff. DGL, my favorite one so far. Um, and I'm not going to show any code for Deep Java library. It's very cool. Uh, so it's an Amazon, um, Amazon and AWS library. Uh, so what they did is, instead of building their own um, framework, they just piggybacked on all the existing frameworks that are there, PyTorch, TensorFlow, MXNet, and all the well-known ones, and they added a layer of Java API. And they have interfaces that basically, depending on what framework, backend implementation you use, it's going to be run the uh, training on it. It's very smart and it's really powerful and it helps you to stick with all the awesomeness, powerfulness of those libraries and run your training and your inference using uh, a Java API, which is really cool. Uh, so I'm not going to show any code, but um, one thing they have is actually DGL server. So imagine you don't want to deal with anything. You just want to, you have an application and you want to have, um, you want to integrate with a machine learning model. I will demo that in a minute. So we can basically use DGL and import one of their models or existing models from TensorFlow, PyTorch, whatever. And it is basically which will expose a, a risk endpoint that you can use to train your model. And, um, the, okay, did it stop as well? Oh gosh. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Uh, oh, Docker is not running at all. Interesting. Okay, so Docker stopped. Yeah, it's somewhere. It's starting. Docker PS. Uh, I think I've run it. Yeah, this one. Okay, so DGL basically is this. If it runs. Yeah. So it's basically a web UI, a web application that you can export your model on. So I'm going to do that live, and I'm not sure if have. OK, so it's ResNet. Res. Res. No? Res. Oh, my gosh. OK, give me a second here. I need to. I'm not going to expose all my download files. Uh, okay, um, finder. Uh, ResNet. Gosh, I can't find it. Anyway, 
Nope. Thanks, NCDJ. Somehow I can't find it. Uh, it was just no. It was not ResNet. It was traced something. Okay, traced. Traced. Uh, okay. Uh, this, and then I want collections, and it was called the models. Traced. Yeah, should be traced. Yes, that's the one. Okay, progress. Um, and then I will call ResNet 18. So that's basically a model. That's the model I was referring to, like ResNet. It's basically a, a image classification model. And then you basically can upload it, and it will be available. It will take some time to upload. It's taking more than it should. Interesting. But when it uploads, you basically have APIs to interact with the model. So here, for example, we can see that the model is pending. It's not deploy fully deployed yet. But then when it's deployed, you can send it provides an API, uh, which is like this one, prediction ResNet, your model. And then you can deploy your application uh, or deploy your model and then interact with your model. Even the Docker image doesn't work. Interesting presentation today. Sorry. Um, Moving on, because I still have four minutes. Uh, so DGL key features. It supports multi-frameworks. I mentioned that, PyTorch, TensorFlow, whatever. Uh, it has simplified model deployment, basically because of DGL Servant. Uh, it helps you to abstract everything and then focus on adding value. It has a very extensive model zoo. So you, must, you provide a lot of models ready for use. It depends on what you, you need, but you won't probably need to uh, train your own model. You can basically grab it and use it out of, um, out, out from the store that they have. Uh, the use cases, it's a deep learning uh, framework. So image, whatever, same thing as we said earlier, image recognition, uh, natural language processing, can robotics, security, and stuff. But what, the, what I like about it is like it's more modern because it, it's piggyback on the stuff that we on the existing frameworks that Python community use as well, which is like very rapid. Uh, model compatibility, because PyTorch, those existing frameworks that DGL use move faster, we, there's some gap between the release of the framework and then adding, uh, adding support for it for DGL, especially if it's a breaking change. So model compatibility can be an issue, and you may still be needed to stay back uh, with an older images. And then that's not really true, but could be a thing uh, within the communities. Basically, it uses TensorFlow, PyTorch. Those are the popular ones. But if you need another one, it will probably be limited. Oracle Tribio, I'm going to go probably really fast now. Uh, Oracle Tribio is a traditional shallow learning model. Uh, DGL, VisRec, Deep Learning 4G, all of them were specialized in deep learning. Oracle Tribio decided to not everyone needs deep learning. We will just focus on providing our customers, our users, with uh, traditional machine learning, um, classification, regression, and so on and so forth. But it has a powerful thing that if you are an enterprise world, they invested heavily in onboarding enterprise constraints and enterprise world into machine learning world. So whatever your input is, database, files, text, images, audio, video, they have mappers around it, so they can take your data. It's basically make it as an input, uh, transform it into their internal data structure or data model, and then shove it in into their pipeline to train your model uh, and then run it, running it for you, and then run your prediction and everything. So it's focus on traditional machine learning, but with a heavy focus on enterprise. So it's basically you can integrate it with your pipeline, you can uh, integrate it with your database, you can integrate with a lot of, a lot of stuff. Um, so it has, it has support for data pipelines. It's scalable. Uh, it basically powers some of the machine learning that Oracle Cloud provides. Um, and it's very enterprise friendly. Uh, let's put it that way. Uh, again, it's focused on machine, traditional machine learning. So everything that's traditional machine learning and not deep learning, classification, regression, anomaly detection, and all of that. Um, 
but it's, I mentioned that multiple times, it's not very focused on deep learning. It has Lix extensive models though. It's still relatively new. It, I think it was out in 2020, so compared to others, it's still new. Um, and it has a small community because it's, it's new. It's starting to grow, but it's, uh, it's uh, still small compared to other. Now, when to use which? DGL is my favorite uh, so far. Uh, and then you can use DGL most of the cases. Uh, because it has its most recent, most powerful, the community is vibrant, and you can benefit from the power of uh, PyTorch, TensorFlow, and so on and so forth. Deep Learning 4G, you can still use it. I'm still reluctant because of the release cycle, not that vibrant anymore. But it's, it is powerful, it is stable, so you can use it to run your uh, model. And Tribu, for if you're enterprise context or you don't need Deep Learning, not every problem in the world can be mapped or need to be mapped to Deep Learning. So machine learning, traditional machine learning algorithm can work. Uh, that's just to say that machine learning is also an engineering discipline. And then with those Java frameworks, we can have an end-to-end -end pipeline or end-to-end -end machine learning journey uh, with Java. So from the training with one of those algorithms, the inference using those algorithms and another uh, popular Java frameworks to deploy your application and then to uh, check in the performance of your application. And that was that. Thank you. I'm sorry for the missing demos. And those are the links.